In the final demo of this module, we'll apply some of the searching techniques that we've learned about to inspect failed row data. Through careful application of these techniques, we will learn how we can process string data without allocating additional strings. The business would like to add the capability for the data processor to provide additional diagnostic information about invalid rows found in the sales data records. The processor should report common causes for invalid rows to support internal teams who may need to correct the historical data extracts or to manually process the information. Earlier in the course, we learned that many string manipulation methods cause allocations due to the immutability of strings. A business requirement is to try and perform our analysis without allocating additional strings. So let's see if we can achieve that goal together. The process sales data samples async method in the sales data class creates an instance of a failed sales data inspector and calls its inspect all method passing in the failed rows from the UK data. Navigating to its definition, we see that it then calls into the stubbed inspect method for each failed row. It's important to point out that this method will essentially duplicate some previous efforts from the parsing methods that we've already developed. I've chosen to implement it in this way for the demo so we can practice the techniques we've learned so far. We'll first perform validation to identify if we have the expected number of columns. One of the simplest ways to check the number of columns in a row is to count the occurrences of the pipe separator. Each row should contain six separators when we have the expected seven columns. Initially, we'll use the link count method to assess this. We can call link methods on a string because strings implement iNumerable. Count accepts a predicate used to identify the items to be counted. We'll count each character where its value is equal to the literal pipe character. When the count is less than six, we have too few elements in the row. So we'll log an appropriate warning message before returning. When the count is greater than six, then we have too many elements in the row. And again, we'll log a warning and return. If neither of these conditions is met, then we have the expected number of elements, and so something else in the row must be invalid. We'll concentrate on a few further validations, focused specifically around the category. We first need to know where the category data begins within the row. We consider the category data to be any character after the final pipe separator. Earlier, we used index of to locate the position of a character within a string. Our current requirement is similar, only we want the last occurrence. Fortunately, we can use the last index of method in such circumstances, assigning its result to a last separator index variable. We also need to identify the position of the colon within the category data. We'll use index of for this, but we need to use an overload accepting a start index. For the start index, we pass in the last separator index, which limits the search for the colon character to only those characters which appear after the last separator. This ensures we don't pick up the position of any other colons from any other column in the row. These two index locations provide enough information for us to perform some further failure analysis and logging. If the category colon index is equal to minus one, we know that the category data was not correctly formatted and therefore we log the necessary warning. We return from the method to avoid any further failure inspection. We should also check that we have some characters for a description which appear after the colon. If the index of the colon character is equal to the row length minus one, we have no characters after the colon's position. We must subtract one from the length because indexing is zero based while the length is not. Our next validation should check that the code portion of the category data is the correct length. One of the requirements for the category is that we should accept but ignore leading and trailing white space. So ideally, 
We want to count the non-white space characters between the pipe separator and the colon. Since we know both of their positions, we can achieve this with a simple for loop. We'll first create a variable to hold the code length. As part of the for loop, the first statement defines and assigns a variable for the index position that we'll inspect first. We will start at the index after the last separator. The second statement accepts the condition during which the loop will continue. We'll continue while the index position is less than the category colon index. Finally, we increment the index variable. Inside the loop, we can check if the character at the current index is white space using the char.isWhitespace method. When the character is not white space, we increment the code length counter. Each loop iteration will move us through the characters between the pipe and the colon separators. Once the loop ends, we will know the count of all non white space characters. We can then check if this count is not equal to 6, the expected length of the code. When the value is not equal to 6, we log a warning and return from the inspect method. Our final analysis should identify whether the description contains any non white space characters. This is not dissimilar from code we've already written, so we'll copy that as a starting point. This time, we will define a variable to track whether a non white space character is present. The loop will start at the index after the colon and continue while the index is less than the length of the row. If we reach a non white space character, we set has description to true and break from the loop. After the loop completes, we log a warning if has description is false, which indicates that the description contains only white space characters. This completes the inspection and analysis that we'll perform in this module. If I run the application, we can scroll up and identify some logs produced by the inspect method during processing. Before we end the module, you'll recall that we were required to try and avoid allocating during the inspection of failed rows. We've avoided allocating any new strings in this method. We've calculated the indexes of crucial characters and used that information to verify certain conditions and to iterate through characters within the string in order to inspect them individually. It would be nice to prove that we've met our no allocation goal. So let's visit the benchmarks project once again. This time, we'll run the failed sales data inspector benchmarks. This class has an example row of data. To fully exercise each conditional check within the inspector and to avoid allocations from logging affecting our results, this row is actually valid. This means it should pass each conditional check and reach the end of the inspect method. The class also has a static failed data inspector instance defined. The inspect row benchmark invokes the inspect method on the static instance, passing in the sample data row. As should now be quite familiar, before we begin running these, we'll ensure we're in release mode and make the startup target the benchmark project. Okay, let's run those benchmarks. After some time, the results are eventually returned. It appears that our method allocates 32 bytes, which is not significant. Do you have any thoughts on where this allocation comes from? You may have identified the link usage as the potential cause, and if you did, you're right. Using link has a small overhead associated with it. We can return to the code and remove the use of the count method. Instead, we can loop over the characters in the row with a for loop. At each index within the row, we'll check the character. We can increment a counter if the character is equal to a pipe. This has the same effect as using count, but it requires a little bit more code from us. Let's rerun the benchmark to check the outcome. This time, when the benchmark completes, we can see that we're now allocating zero bytes within this method. By using the index and last index of methods, plus a few loops, we have met the requirement from the business. Before we move on, I'll reset to debug mode 
and make the data processing project the target once again. Join me in the next module where we will apply some techniques to modify string data.